This episode is brought to you by Bulletproof Script Coverage, where screenwriters go to get their scripts read by top Hollywood professionals. Learn more at CoverMyScreenplay.com. I'd like to welcome to the show Michael Jammin, man. How you doing? Good. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you, man. We're just trying to survive the uh, the COVID onslaught right now in our I, industry. Yeah, I hear you. It's <laughs> it's not easy out there. Yeah. It's, it's not easy. And unfortunately, I, I don't foresee it getting any better anytime in the near future. No, I don't even know how they thought it was going to get better. Like, how do you put people on a set together? Like, I, like they're all going to wear masks on camera. How is that going to work? So yeah, I, don't, I don't know. We'll talk about we'll talk about like specifically TV, because at least features you might be able to get outside a lot. And maybe you can make some stuff work on location. But or you just shoot in New Zealand, which is obviously COVID free. <laughs> Yeah, but they don't want us there. And no, <laughs> nobody wants us anywhere in the, the, the world right now. I know. <laughs> but that's another podcast for another time. Um, all right, so before we get started, how did you get into uh, to the business? Well, right, you know, in high school, that's why I, I wanted to be a comedy writer. I saw Cheers on TV. I was like, that's what I want to do with my life. Yes. Like that, you know. And then I went to college, and two weeks after graduating, I got into my car, drove to LA, and uh, didn't know anyone. And I was like, "Well, I'm I'm gonna, not going to leave until I make it." And so I struggled a couple of years. I was a PA for a couple of years. I wrote on some horrible projects, but then I finally broke in with my partner, mm-hmm. and we got a job as a, a staff writer on a show called Just Shoot Me. And then we've been that's, working ever since. That's actually a, I remember that show. That was a pretty popular show back in the day. Yeah, yeah, it was a big show. Yeah, and and that was your first gig in the in the yeah. writing room. Yeah. Yeah. Staff writer. Yeah. Staff writer. How did, okay. So, okay. Let's, let's, let's dissect that for a second. How did you get that first paid gig? Like, how did you get that gig? Cause it's not easy to become a staff writer. Even, no. at the, even at that time, it was still fairly competitive, not as competitive as it is now, but yeah. Yeah. it was still fairly competitive. So how did you get in? How did, like, did you use well, a sample? How did it work? It, it, to be honest, my first job before that, I was, I was, a, um, an assistant for executive producers and they were running a TV show. So I was answering their phones. And then they gave us, a, me and my partner, a script. And they were running a show called Lois and Clark uh, Superman. Of course. Right? Of course. So that was my first professional script. They gave us, they say, okay, we'll let you pitch. And we pitched a, and a couple ideas and they loved one. And that one became like a, like a big hit <laughs> on their, you know, for, for Lois and Clark. So with that, we were kind of able to solicit agents. And then we found an agent. And my, together, my partner and I, we must have written probably eight or ten spec scripts together. And the first one we wrote was a friend's, but a spec script. And then we kept on writing because we didn't get any more work. But ironically, that script got into the hands of Steve Levitan's assistant when he was staffing for Just Shoot Me. The first script, that was the one that got us work, even though we had written eight others after that. So it was your very first script, which they always say is the garbage script. It's the one that yes. no one's told- ever going to look. It's just a, it's a, a sacrificial lamb in your Exactly. Your- exactly. <laughs> the agent was like, eh, it's not that good, you know. Whatever. That's the one that got us work. You know, she's no longer our agent anymore. <laughs> obviously. Obviously. We'll talk about agents in a little bit, which I know I'm sure uh, you have a lot to say about. Um, yeah. So so you write. So that was my the big question. A lot of I, I always talk to screenwriters and they always want to write like an original if they want to get into television or now television slash streaming, which is basically yeah. the same thing at this point. Right. Um, they always like I want to I want to sh- like write an original or I want to write a pilot and that's going to be my writing uh, sample. Right. Do you suggest writing sample scripts of existing popular shows just as a writing sample or to go in with a, a fresh idea? You know what? That's a really good question. Like back when I broke in, it was easier because there's four networks and everyone knew the big shows right. like Seinfeld, Friends. Like everyone watched those shows. Now, what's the one show that everyone's watching? There, there really aren't that for sitcoms. There's really all. Awesome. It's just Tiger King, obviously. But other than that, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so like, like last year there was uh, Big Bang Theory, but that's no longer you know on the air. So, or maybe Barry's the big hit, but that's still that's not like it's a great not, show. But I don't know if everyone's watching it. Not everyone was. I mean, Big Bang was probably it was Big Bang was kind of like the last run of yep. that of those kind of com- like Lock, those sitcoms definitely. like friends or cheers or seinfeld yeah. the, that was the last one is there one going modern family just left exactly so there really there really isn't uh so that's why people are writing original stuff but the problem with the original is like that's a whole different skill set creating characters in a world and a fresh original pilot like 
if when I'm hiring in a show, I don't need to know if you can do that. I need to know if you can write for existing characters. I don't need to know if you can create your own. That's not the job requirement. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's a lot harder for people trying to break in now because they have to show original work uh, just because no one's no one's watching those other shows. You can't really spec those other shows. So the bar is a little unfair. That's why, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a little unfair for people breaking in. So would you, uh, so if, if I want to get a job on Stranger Things or right. on, or on uh, you know, on any of the, uh, the like it's a Netflix streaming sitcom, one day at a time, let's say, yeah. it just come to mind. Um, do you write a spec, po- a spec no. script for that show? You don't, no, right? no, because you'll never do it as well. And whoever reads it was going to be like, that's not, that's, oops, I hope that doesn't come on. That's not how it works. They'll, they'll be like, that's not, no, you didn't catch the voice. And you never will. It, like, the best way not to get hired on a show is to spec that show. Like, I remember even when I was on Just Shoot Me, reading specs for Just Shoot Me, going, that's not, no, no, no. And, you know, because all the, everyone was writing, like, Nina, like a giant whore. And, like, Nina's not a whore. But I can see why you're watching that show, why you think that. But for us on the inside, there's a, there's a very fine line that we play on on how we create you know write for those characters so you're never going to get it as an outsider so if you want to get a job on one day at a time don't submit a one day at a time spec so you always do something of a, another show popular in that same kind of genre exactly the same tone right right now now how do you when you're in a writer's room because you you've been a showrunner and you've been a staff writer yeah um in your, when you're in the writer's room, which we'll talk about the future of writer's rooms as a general statement, but yeah. when you're Zoom. working when you're working in a writer's room, what is the dynamic of a sitcom, you know, a, a fully functioning, you know, hitting at all cylinders kind of writer's room in a comedy world? I've been, I've been, I've been in some great writing room and some ones that are not that great. Uh, it all kind of depends – the tone of the show is is dependent on the showrunner. What kind of are they collaborative or are they kind of jerks? You know, you got all sorts. Obviously, <laughs> uh, the job of a staff writer, I think, I think many people make this mistake. They think that your job is to make the best show possible, which is not what your job is. Your job as a staff writer, and that's any level, that can be the bottom staff writer to all the way to co-exec. Your job is to make the best version of the show that the co-showrunner wants to make. And there's a big difference. So you could, there's no point arguing with the showrunner about what, what's going to be good or bad. That's up for him or her to decide. And it's your job to please them. You don't, have, you don't, shouldn't argue and say, no, I think America will like this. That's not for you to say. <laughs> because none of them, you know, you just do what your boss, give your boss what your boss wants. So it's a very yeah. much of a hierarchy um, system in television, much more than yeah. features. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, you know, as the higher up you go, the, the more responsibility, the more you're expected to contribute. So a staff writer doesn't, isn't expected to do the same amount of work as a co-executive producer. Uh, and so sometimes they think, well, that person is talking X amount of time. I need to talk X as much. But you don't. You have to talk. They're, pay, they're getting paid a lot more than you. So you don't have to do as much. So you don't need to fight with them. You know, so when you do, because that's the one thing I always see thousands of co-executives and executives and producers and all these credits when I sh- yeah. see my shows. Can you explain what these are? Because, I mean, yes, it's it just because it's it gets stupid sometimes. Like literally, I would I'll watch a show and there's 10 or 15 co-executives and then executive producers and then right. the creator. And it's like there's just so many. Can you explain why that is? Right. So you have the showrunner. And that's the boss, the head writer. That person's usually the executive producer. But from the starting from the bottom, you have the staff, the writing staff. The lowest writer is a staff writer. And then you get um, then you get story editor, executive story editor, go up to co-producer, producer, supervising producer, co-executive producer. Usually the co-exec is maybe like the number two, the second in command when the executive producer is out of the room. And then you have other executive producers uh, who might be a manager. They might be ta- talent, might have a credit. You might have executive producer who uh, created the, who sold the book that it's based on. So there's a lot of people who are non-writing executive producers that might get a credit, but they're not writers. Is that, and also some um, network executives might be in that world? Some, yeah, studio, yeah, absolutely. How do you deal with studios <laughs> and executives that come in and just you smile <laughs> and you smile a lot and so uh huh and just say no, I'm not going to go do that behind the closed doors. <laughs> 
sometimes you get great advice and, and great notes and sometimes you don't. Um, but that's part of the, you know, when you work as a writer and you're getting paid, part of the job is to like, listen, you know, you got to take your ego out of the game and you have to play ball. You have to be nice and polite. If you fight everybody, you know, you can, you want to use them as allies. So you want to work with them. And if you can give them a note, you give them a note, you know, you give them, take their note. Now, can you talk a little bit about the, the politics inside a television writing world uh, just a well, television show in general there's politics involved there's politics mm-hmm. and everything but yeah. I, I think it's something that's not really spoken about so like a lot of the stuff you've just said are invaluable little tips like um you don't tell the exec the the, the, the uh, showrunner or the co-executive like no i think the character would do this if you're a staff writer that's not yeah. kind of the hierarchy of right. things you'll get you'll get you'll get you'll get axed fairly quickly. i see it happen all the time Really? Because yeah. it's ego and you're not going to win that battle. Well, it's, I think it's because um, staff writers want to prove they, they want to prove their job. They want to prove that they can contribute. Mm-hmm. And the easiest way for them to prove that they contribute is by shitting on your idea. <laughs> That's what they think. <laughs> and so because it's much harder to come up with a good idea. It's very hard to come up with an idea that we're going to that you're going to use. It's much easier to say why your idea is terrible uh, or why it's not going to work. And they think that's part of the creative process, but it really, it really isn't. In the room, there's, there's an expression, it's pitch, don't bitch. So if you have a problem, don't come up with a problem, come up with a solution. And then everyone will love you. But don't point out problems unless you have a solution. And, 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 and so a lot, of times so, you, a lot of times you'll hear writers do exactly that. They're like, oh, there's this and this and this. Well, what, 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 how do you fix it? Well, I don't know. I'm yeah, just letting you know. I was still, when I started off, I didn't know what I was doing. So I was like, well, I might as well just tell you what, that you're doing something wrong as opposed to me doing something positive. So we're all guilty of that. And I see it all the time with, with staff writers, I, all the time. Yeah. So as far as the politics are involved, the hierarchy is that the showrunner is the absolute boss. Yeah. Yeah. You know, other than the studio, maybe above him, that's paying. Well, yeah, right. The showrunner is never really the boss. The sh- you, you know, because there's always someone telling you what you're doing wrong. That could be the studio, it could be the star, it could, it could be the network. So even when you're the boss, you're never the boss. So, so. It, it also depends on what where you are in the in the 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 lifespan of that show. First season, everyone's kind of hanging out yeah. we're all trying to figure out if we're going to get picked up for the next season yeah everyone's operating out of fear especially I, now <laughs> exactly yeah. when you're in season five or six and this is a this is a, a bona fide hit a series has been around for four or five seasons let's say then the power shift could be different it could be the showrunner it could be the star that's now become mm-hmm. a star and now they start they start throwing their weight around a little bit more and they're yeah. like you know what i have an idea yep Mm-hmm. And I think we should go. I think we should make this character do this now. And the entire sh- and the entire writers' room goes, "That's a yeah. horrible idea." And then the showrunner's like, "If I don't appease the uh, the star, this is going to be a problem. But if I do appease the star, the whole show is going to go down the hill." So, yeah. am, am I am I speaking? That's it. it definitely happens. <laughs> definitely happens. Yeah. What's your? Yeah. How do you? So, as a showrunner, I have to ask you: How do you deal with that? Like, how do you deal with like? these kind of influences coming in from all over and it's your job to keep the boat on on the path that you feel is the right path i know this is this is just landmines everywhere <laughs> yeah it's it's definitely hard when uh, you know I've, I've had my partner and i've had some easy experiences in that we ran a show called marin starring mark marin yeah. and he was in the writer's room the whole time yeah. so because he's one of the writers. And so we didn't have, there was never a power struggle because he was in there the whole time. And if he had a problem with something, it's okay, here, let's figure it out together. Mm-hmm. I think it becomes trickier when the star is not in the writer's room. When you put him in the writer's room, you say, okay, we're going to work this out. We're going to figure this out. And then they go, oh, I'm going to be here all night. And then suddenly they, be, <laughs> suddenly they play ball. But if your star is not in the writer's room, then they go, okay, you're going to be here all night. I'm going home. And that's when things get ugly. Yeah, fix, so, it. fix it and I'll see you in the morning. Yeah, yeah. And but we've had experiences, so yeah. And and it, and it goes. I'm sure, and I'm assuming you have horror stories, and you have stories that are fantastic, and just like, oh, that yeah. was just a pleasure to work. Like Marin, I'm assuming he's. I've heard great things about him, and he's. he's yeah, he was really. He was always game. Like you'd pitch something to him and be crazy, and he'd go, "Yeah, okay, I'll do that." And you're like, "Really?" <laughs> you know, because he was just game. So he's very and- open. Yeah. So, so let, let's talk a little bit about COVID right now, because we're as we're recording this, we're in the middle of COVID. It's we're arguably still in the first wave of this thing. 
Um, mm -hmm. I remember a, a month ago or a month and a half ago, Hollywood was reopening. There was going to be new guidelines. Yeah. And as I was and I was as they were announcing all this and the unions were signing off on stuff and all of this, I'm just going to myself. This is you guys are insane. I know everybody wants to go back to work. We right. All, but the insurance would never you, they would never sign off on it. So it doesn't matter if everyone wants to. Right. I was going to say that's like if someone gets sick on your set. And then someone, God forbid, dies because yeah. of it. Yeah, you're liable as a production. So unless yeah. you've got some coverage, you are leaving yourself wide open. And then, of course, there's the. I think there were some productions that were wanting the actors and the and the and the, and the um, crew to sign off waivers, going, "If you get COVID, it's on you." Yeah, right. Right. And and, so. and I think I think SAG said, "No, no, 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 no. We're not. <laughs> we're not doing that." Yeah. Uh we're taking out a, a few animated projects <clears throat> just because that seems to be the only thing that's safe right now. Right. And so, okay. So with COVID, how is, I, you know, writer room, writer's rooms are still going right now. Um, but uh, in, in a zoom style process, cause a, a lot yeah. of the late night shows, um, are still going from home. Yeah. Um, and they have writer's rooms and I, I was watching an interview with, um, Trevor Noah and they're like, yeah, the first, couple of weeks we're just like on top of each other who's muted who's not muted who's who's yeah. talking who's not to but then he goes but then we just got into it have you had any experience with no i was on the last show i was on uh, tacoma fd and that's a live action show <clears throat> but that hasn't come back for i'm sure it will but it hasn't come back yet for the third season so i don't know what the plan and if they are going to pick it up for the third season i i think they are but i'm not sure when because when can they shoot it so I don't know what the what the network's plan is on that. So we haven't I haven't been in a virtual writers room yet. How do you how do you feel it's going to work in your from your opinion? <laughs> I think it, I think for it to work it has to be a small room. I think you can't have the same number of uh, writers as you used to because everyone's talking over each other. You know what is what is what is the standard writers room in a comedy yeah. world? It's a, they're getting smaller now because especially as you go to cable and the budgets get smaller, maybe eight writers. And, but on Marin first season, we, there was just four of us, uh, four of us, there was four of us. Yeah. And Mark was one of them. Yeah. That, that's actually a pretty tight. That's me. That's, that's tiny because you have to do 13 episodes and then that means everyone has to write a ton and, and you only have like 10 weeks of pre-production. It was really, it was, uh, it, it was, you know, it was stressful. We had to, you know, bang that thing out. So, so. That, that's a great, uh, that's a good segue to the next question. You you obviously started in the traditional television world when there were yeah. only four major networks, uh, yeah. and now there's a thousand networks with twenty thousand shows. Budgets yeah. have started to drop, 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 drop dramatically um, because it's yeah. just the nature of the beast. And you've worked on both sides. And you've worked on cable shows. You've worked on streaming shows. How do you adjust? <laughs> because the budgets, the budgets keep going down and down, right? Ah. When we did Marin, that was the first show my partner and I ran. And I remember the, the budget on that was about a third of what a network show was. And so a network show you might shoot in five days. Marin, we had to shoot in two and a half days. Each episode, two and a half days. And I remember getting a tour. They put us up in some kind of dumpy building in Glendale, some kind of low rent uh, production office. And the woman was giving me a tour of the office. The woman from the studio was giving me a tour of the office. And she goes, I shouldn't tell you this, but we're all laughing at you in the office. And I'm like, yeah, you shouldn't tell me. Like, <laughs> just, <laughs> why are you laughing? And she goes, because your budget's so low. We don't think you could make it. And I was like, Ugh, this is not what I needed to hear on my first day as a showrunner. And I said, well, do we get to have a whiteboard? I meant it. I like, do we have a whiteboard? And she goes, we have a supply room full of whiteboards. You can have as many whiteboards as you want. And I was like, oh, no, we'll figure it out. And that's no problem. You just write to what you can do. So that means when you have, when you write a scene, you don't write a scene in an amusement park. You write a scene in someone's backyard. You know, you just make it small and you just change the way you write. It's, and, and, and when you watch the show, sometimes scenes were poorly lit. Sometimes the coverage was a little lacking, but no one, the critics never said that. The critics never said this scene was dark. The critics never said, oh, why is a Cramble Street? You know, they were like, hey, this is great. The writing, they comment on the writing and the acting. And so no one said, you know, they were kind. Because no one's watching a show for the lighting. You're not going to watch a show on – Not comedy. Some, specifically not comedy. Yeah. Not comedy. You're not going to say, what a well-lit show. You, if it's no good, you're going to turn it off. You know? Right. It, that's, the, that's icing. It's not, the, it's not the foundation. It's not the, right. the, the main meat of the cake, if you will. Um, right. Now, there was another thing I wanted to ask you about. The, the world of – <laughs> the Seinfelds, the Friends, the Cheers, 
residuals of those shows are are legendary i mean the the, the friends cast still makes i'm sure the writing staff still makes obscene amounts mm-hmm. like you get one show and it's a hit for eight or ten seasons you're good you, you don't have to work anymore um oh, well not so much for a writer <clears throat> for a writer you, you used to get half every time it airs you got half half of what you half and half and half and then it gets it's you know it's a it's a if you know calculus it's a limit you there's an extra you reach a cap and you'll never make more than that because it gets half half and half right. and then but now the buyouts are going to like netflix and they just give you a one-time fee right so they buy it out and you don't really get residuals you get like a one-time check Right. So that that changes the whole conversation because the days of a modern family, uh, the days of uh, of friends, but even modern family that just finished this 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 year, mm-hmm. those re- those residual packages, the studios are just trying to go away from that because they're like, oh, wait a minute, Netflix isn't doing it. So why do we have to do it now? Even Disney's like, yeah, we're going to give you like two runs of residuals and that's pretty much it, guys. And that's for yeah. everybody's staff and everything. So that really changes the game for not only actors, but for showrunners, for creators. These these really fat packages that they would get in the back end are mm-hmm. going away, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. How, how? What's your feeling on that? And how has that changed the way you think about your career moving forward? And specifically, because you you obviously started back in the day when those packages were still around. Yeah. Um, and they are still around to a certain extent in the, in the network world. Some people, yeah. For some people, but yeah. how does that change the tra- trajectory of a, of a writer's career? Because before, you kind of like were looking forward to those that mailbox money. <laughs> Yeah, it's it makes it a lot harder to be honest as a middle class writer. As it kind of squeezes you out because people used to rely on those residuals, and now they're just they're not there anymore. And the network, the orders are shorter and shorter. So in the past, I was on just shoot me. You do twenty four episodes a year, and you get paid per episode. Now you'll be on a cable show. You'll do maybe eight or ten episodes a season, and then you got to find another job. You have to somehow you know it's, another job. Yeah, yeah. So it's definitely. Uh, it's squeezing out. It's going to squeeze out writers. It's going to squeeze out people who just can't afford to do it. You know, it's not good. <laughs> it's, uh, and but it's the it's the nature of the business. The way it's streaming has changed everything. Yeah, yeah. And so you can bitch about it, or you have to just you know accept it and adopt, adapt, figure yeah, something out. I mean, it's people like Shonda Rhimes and Ryan Murphy. Those guys are getting such upfront massive. Yeah. You don't need to worry about them. They're doing okay. Yeah, they're they're okay. They were they were fine before yeah. Netflix gave Shonda Rhimes a hundred million dollars. I think yeah, she's, exactly. yeah, they were yeah. completely fine. <laughs> yeah. Us, everyone else, we got to worry about. But I, but I wanted to kind of bring that up because I want there to be a realistic idea of what an actual television writer is going to be yeah. doing in the in the from now moving forward. There is everyone's like, oh, but it's the golden age. There's so much opportunity. Absolutely, there is a lot of shows. There's more shows, yeah. but the money is mm-hmm. much, you, much. I spend as much time uh, either looking for work or developing work, creating my own shows with my partner, than I do actually writing, working on a show. I mean, it used, you know, the balance has shifted. So you now. Money. It's much more money, but you're also in a position that ha- you have track record, you have a reputation yeah. that you can walk in with a brand new show and kind of, and I've been a showrunner and all that stuff. So yeah. you're in a, a very unique scenario that that makes, that makes all the sense in the world. You shouldn't be going after staff writing jobs at this point. In your yeah, yeah, right, right. <laughs> um, you should be doing other things and packaging it out. But moving forward, like, can you, is, is there a standard? Is, what's the writer guild, guild's uh, minimum now for, um, for like a staff writer on a comedy yeah. show, on streaming? I don't know. I don't know offhand. I, uh, it might be a few thousand a week. I don't know. It, it's different it's for not, different forms. Yeah, it's, just, it's not. It's anywhere between a few thousand to low five figures, or not. It's not going to get to low five <laughs> figures. Staff writers get paid per week, whereas other writers higher up get paid per episode. Oh, oh, they're just just the straight up staff writer, and they're just there for the, the duration. For the bottom level, and that's a weekly minimum salary. And I don't know because I don't really know what it is. Like yeah. two or three. I don't know something. Yeah, like two or three grand. Yeah. So it's it's money, but in L.A. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, for sure. I mean, uh, when I was an assistant in L.A. twenty five years ago, I was an assistant. I was making dirt money, but I had enough money to make have a, get my own studio apartment. But now, forget well, where it. Where was I, that? Where was that studio apartment? That was in uh, in uh, the Fairfax district in West Hollywood. So wow. I had a, you couldn't get that yeah. now. <laughs> No, no. I had a one bedroom for six fifty a month. Now, now it's probably like two thousand a month. That same building, you know, apartment. So six fifty. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So if you're gonna write a pilot, um, well, first of all, before you do that, 
can you explain what a show Bible is? Yeah, and I don't really, I guess it, we don't do that. I, I don't do that on my level. It's basically, you're telling people when you sell the show, here's the pilot, but also here's the show and here's the, the run of the show. Here's what we think season two and season three is going to be. And I understand they kind of want that now for, for a lot of streaming shows. They want them to be serialized because people are, um, because people are binge watching. So as opposed to like Modern Family, you could watch any episode out of order and it's just as enjoyable. Pretty but now they want it to be serialized. So this one, because the next one, that way you can't stop watching. And so in that sense, they really kind of want a Bible. They want they want to know what the three arc, three season arc is, which especially for a young writer, a new writer, I don't know how they're expected to know how to do that. For me, it's not, it's not as hard. But for a new writer, it's like, Jay, yeah. You know, but also I find that limiting because when you as you work on the show, you discover the relationships at work and the dynamics and whatever you think the plan is, you throw it all out because you go, oh, this is working. Let's go with that. So the whole idea of Bibles to me, I find a little strange, but that's kind of what people want now. So if you if you are um, if you're writing a pilot for a new show. Mm-hmm. And you really are behind this pilot, and you think this is this is a good, or, or you have two or three of these pilots. Should you attach Bibles to that at this point? Are you asking me or, or a young writer? A young writer. I feel like for a young writer, their job is to write a good pilot script because if it's good, they're going to get teamed up. They need to get teamed up with a showrunner like me to sell it in any way. Yeah, to, and, that, and that's something that most writers don't understand, especially young writers. That like, if you even if you've got the next Breaking Bad, they're not going to let you run the show. No, no, and you're not going to even sell it without uh, some other piece of the uh, some piece of the package, whether it's a showrunner, or a piece of talent, a director, something else has to be part of the equation, or else you're not going to sell it. So, do you, if you have an idea for a script, do you need to write a whole bible? I don't think so. Your first, the first challenge is to write the, is to write a good script. And then team up with the showrunner, and the showrunner will help guide you. Will that writer, as a creator of the show, will they still have? If let's say, let's say I write a pilot, and and I attach you to it, and you like, I love this, let's do it. You're the creator, Alex. Um, we're gonna take this over to Netflix. I got my boy Bob over there. He's gonna get us in there, and you get a deal. Will I, as as the creator of it, still have? Not creative control because that's not I, I'm not that delusional, but what right. what what can we what can a writer in my position expect to as far as creatively and and financially work in that world? You, creatively, you would be hopefully attached to the project. Uh, as, I like the way you said hopefully attached. Oh. Yeah, uh, you know if you make too much of a, if you make too much of a stink, they'll kick you out. I, I, I okay, so <laughs> I worked. Uh, this is a year or two ago. Someone brought us a producer brought us a, a talent. It was, um, it was a writer who had a show. She would created something on YouTube that had some episodes and they're like short little episodes, like five or 10 minutes. And some of them were quite good. And some of them were. Eh. And so the plan was to attach her. They wanted to attach us to be showrunners of her show. We liked the, the basic premise and the characters. And then she got a little greedy and and she wanted more and more and more. And. We were waiting for the, and I, I kept, you know, I was like, I don't need to deal with this. I, I'm not in, part, in charge of that negotiation. The producers in the studios are. They can leave me out of this. And then suddenly, the deal just went away. It just went. She became too much of a pain in the ass, and it went away. So, you know, you got to understand your first, your first opportunity. You are going to get screwed. I got screwed on my first opportunity. Everyone, everyone does. You have to accept that. You don't have leverage. So, play ball. Accept the fact that you know, hey. Hope, I'm just going. I'm here along for the ride. I'm here to help, and I'm not here to make waves. And then on your second project, that's when you start making some money. So Larry, Larry David's not going to so, get screwed on his next project, is what you're saying? No, no. Larry David, he's again, he's okay. <laughs> it's it's someone he's who fine. has no credit. <laughs> he's fine. It's someone who has no credit who needs to just hey, you know, just nod and go along for the ride. And just and, and yeah, just go yes, yes. Uh, just, I just want a credit. I want to get paid a little bit, and this, let's move on. And if you if you can, can you can you please express? This is the biggest piece of advice I give anybody who asks me about being a writer, being a filmmaker, being getting into the business. The number one piece of advice I gave is like, just don't be a dick. Oh, oh, I see it all the time, man. I see it all. It's like you're exactly right because. 
you know, people, okay, assistants, when you're talking to an assistant on a, at an agency or whatever, they're not going to be assistants for a long time. They're going to rise up to agents in a, in a year or two. And same thing with anybody in any position, a PA, you don't abuse them. You just be nice to them just because you want to be nice, but also because they are going to be in power at one point. So don't be a dick to anybody. That's and crazy. It, you never underestimate the power of just being able to sit in, specifically for TV writers, to sit in a room for eight to 10 hours, if not longer, mm -hmm. with somebody and enjoy their company. That yeah. is honestly sometimes more valuable than a super talented writer who's just a pain in the ass to work with. I, saw, I worked on one show, we had a pain in the ass writer, and he never came back for season two. So. And there, and Every, have you and have you worked with you know arguably writers who you knew the other guy might have been a better writer, but he was just such a pain in the ass. You're just like, I, it's not I, worth it. It's it's just not it's not worth it, right? Talent. If you can find somebody else who who's just as good and not a pain in the ass, there's a lot of competition out there. Right. It's you know. Not, yeah, and a lot of times they think they're the last coke in the desert, as they say. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> Right. Now, what advice would you give um, a writer, a, a young writer or, or a writer who's just starting out? How do they get attention from a manager or an agent? And when is it appropriate to even approach them? Which I think that's a very specific thing. <laughs> that's Here, a point out. When I'm staffing for a show, I got to read a ton of scripts. And these are from writers who are young writers, but they have representation. Like or else I wouldn't have gotten the script. And I'm telling you, 95 percent of the scripts are just no good. And these are people who have representation. And I think what you're asking is actually the wrong question. I think the, the right question to ask is, how can I make sure my script is good or, or great? Because no one's looking for mediocre writers. You know, right. if you're a mediocre writer, there's, I don't, no one wants to be, they want a good writer or a great writer. And so the question is, how can I make my script good or great as opposed to how can I find a manager or an agent? Because once you have a manager, so what? That doesn't mean anything. I mean, you get to tell your mom, look, I got a manager and your mom's like, oh, maybe it's going to work out. But <laughs> that doesn't put money in your table. You know, the money doesn't go into your pocket with a manager. You need to have a job. Right. And that's, that's kind of why I asked the question, because there is this myth out there that people, uh, especially people who are not been in the industry for a long time that they think that once they get the agent and the manager all their dreams will come true the agent's going to start getting them in all those rooms and the money's just going to start flowing in because they're going to hustle for you no they're not exactly <laughs> their job is to field offers basically if they if an agent has 10 writers and they submit all 10 writers for this one job opening they don't care who gets it as long as one of them gets it they're happy like you know that's their why they don't care who and so they're not going to fight for you Maybe they'll submit you, but they're going to fight for the one who is who e gets the job easier. Now, what is the biggest mistake you see screenwriters make in with television pilots or television writing in general? Uh, the single bit. Uh, well, one of them is just not starting the story soon enough. And uh, and that's just basic understanding how how to write a screenplay. And so uh, if I am reading a script and I the story hasn't started by page five, if I'm not engaged, forget it. Goodbye. I pick up another one. Now that seems unfair, but I got a stack of scripts up to the roof. Why would I like, maybe it'll get good at the end, but who cares? Like I'm not, I'll just read the next one. The next one will get be good early or hopefully be, you know, start the story sooner. And I think that's all, it may seem cruel, but it, it's actually fair. You and I do the same thing. If we're watching a TV show and it's no good after five minutes, we don't say, well, let's give it another 30 minutes. We change the channel. Right. So exactly. Like I, right now, my wife and I are, we're in, in COVID land. So we're going through shows again. Like we've, oh, sh that show that you've always wanted to watch and you've had on your list. We're now starting to get to them. And then when we get to them, like we'll give them an episode, maybe two. And then it's yeah, find not, 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 it's no. But it's going to get good later. I, I don't care. I don't care. Like <laughs> I know a lot of people listening will probably freak out, but like I, I've never watched Game of Thrones. So uh, I, I watched one or two episodes. My wife both watched it and we were just like, I'm sure it's going to get really good. Interesting. But, but I, I, I don't have the time. And if my wife's not into it, right, what's the point? It's, it's just hard, man. I can't, I can't take on Game right. of Thrones without the support of my wife because we only have so much TV time that we can watch. Right. And we generally right. don't watch it separately. We generally watch it together. So I just, I couldn't get into it. And I'm sure one day maybe I will, but... Right. You know. I love it. Okay. I know. I know. A lot of people do. A lot of people love it. Like, I'm, right. I'm a huge Breaking Bad fan. Like, I. Oh, I'm, the best show ever. I mean, it's the best show ever. Vince yeah. Williams is a genius. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I remember, I remember Walking Dead when it first came out. Uh, I, 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 I'm not, I, my wife got into the zombie show. Like, it was insane. 
but then I, I, I after season six, I just like it's too much. I can't anymore. Yeah, um, yeah it's just Deegan. It's, I can't. I can't do it anymore. <laughs> but um, but at a certain point, you either lose people or you gain people. And a show like in, in the comedy world, like like Friends, I still think is probably as as brilliant of a of a sit in Seinfeld. Um, mm-hmm. To a certain, you know, Seinfeld and, and Friends, both of them. Cheers is great. I was watching. I went to my mom's house last year to visit, and I was watching Golden Girls. Golden Girls is great, man. What it's a, a great show. What a great <laughs> show! Mm-hmm. Like she was, just, yeah. And like, oh, I haven't seen Golden. I remember watching Golden Girls forever, and I was watching it, and I'm just sitting there going, "The writing is so good. The performances Chris are so good." Who ran Modern Family? Chris Lloyd ran Modern Family. And then he also, you know, he ran Frasier before that. And we, in between, we worked for them on a show called Out of Practice that he created. And, and he's a, just a brilliant writer. But I think his very first credit was was Golden Girls. Yeah, that's it's yeah. it's it's amazing to go back and watch some of those some of those early shows. It's just like, right. and, and by the way, who, now they would never make it because who's going to sit down and watch five or four, you know, uh, senior citizens? Who cares? It's funny. It's great. The cat, but they don't make those. They won't make that show now because the, what's the entry point? You'd have to be twenty five year olds or whatever. You know the funny so thing, it's a sh- You know the funny thing is too that Blanche, who was the uh, that character Blanche, she was like fifty three in the show. Yeah, Jennifer Lopez is fifty like two. <laughs> Is that right? Wow! So I saw that online somewhere. I was like, "This is fifty. This is, this is fifty-two <laughs> in 1985. Yeah, and this is fifty-two in 2020." And you're just like, Jennifer Aniston's in her, yeah, in her late 40s, early 50s. Salma Hayek is in, and you look at yeah. these women like they look amazing. But J Lo's a freak of nature. She, yeah. she obviously drinks uh, the blood of of infants. Um, yeah, <laughs> to say, oh, it's insane. <laughs> who could blame? I mean, Jesus. Um, so those are the, that's the biggest mistake. Any advice you would give um, screenwriters who are trying to break into television or into when I say television, I mean include streaming. That's uh, that's a given. Yeah, yeah. So tell and trying to get a job right now in television. Honestly, I, I really think it's more important to focus on your craft and get your craft to a place where it's the writing is really good, as opposed to uh, you know. It, it, that way, you make Hollywood come to you, as opposed to you know me coming to Hollywood. But also with YouTube and um, in, in Facebook, it's so much easier to put your own content up and make something splashy that people come to you. I, there's a comedian out, Sarah Cooper. She she just hit it a couple of weeks ago by doing these Donald Trump impersonations where she just mouths. She takes a speech and she mouths, you know, she lip syncs to his speech, but she adds her funny expressions and she became a hit. And now Hollywood came to her. She just got signed with by William Morris Endeavor because of that, because she was putting up her own content. And people were discovering great content. So it's not like she was banging on doors. I think she was earlier before that when they weren't opening. And now she did it herself. And now Hollywood comes to her. And that's the difference between now and when Just Shoot Me started. Like you can create your own content and you have an avenue, a distribution outlet to put those things out there. And comedy specifically doesn't have to be so high. I mean, it just has to be funny. Yeah, it doesn't have to be well produced. No. You don't need to spend a ton of money. You have, you have a phone. You can edit on your phone with an app for five dollars, and you know it's a little harder now with with COVID. But whatever, do a puppet show. I don't know. Put up your content, and that's but make it good. You know. Do you suggest that writers create like because there's a lot of these Amazon Prime series uh, that are out that are like you know they, they they're just self produced and they have like eight episodes and I've seen these running and they're funny and stuff. Do you mm-hmm. recommend writers? does that have more cachet with you that they have something produced that they produce themselves that you can send you an episode of that they to see their writing or is it better the old-fashioned way with just a a script it's not so much they they should send me an episode i should discover an episode it should be so big people should say hey have you seen this you know have you heard of this so again it's not about knocking on doors hey michael will you watch my stupid episode no it's the other way around you know make something great and focus on the writing and then you'll be, you know, you'll be sought after. Now I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all of my guests. Um, what are three pilots that all TV writers should read? Oh, world! Wow, that's you know, I've, I read so many. I'll go back and I'll go back and reread pilots just to see how they do it when I'm working on something else. So the Frasier pilot was terrific. Uh, uh, the Taxi pilot was it's an interesting pilot because it doesn't really fit the mold of the show, uh, but. But there's, I, 
boy, there's so many, and they're probably all online. The more you read, the better, honestly. But um, yeah, Friends. Frasier was Friends. Friends was very good, but like the Seinfeld pilot is not what Seinfeld became. Right. You know, it was the Seinfeld Chronicles, right? right? Yeah. So even season one was like, that's not the show. So, but it's go. But you should read as many as you can just for story structure. Look, where are the act breaks? Uh, how are the characters uh, introduced? Where are the, the act break moments are probably the most important thing to look at. What kind of act breaks are we, are we telling? And what's the world? And what's the main what's the main relationship we're going to be following in this pilot? Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Yeah. It took me – well, learning how to break a story properly. That took years and years. And I remember for the first couple of years of my career, I was like, this is a magic trick. I, like, I don't know how these guys are doing it. You'd pitch something and in one of the writers, no, that's not, that's not an act break. That goes here in mid-act two. And you're like, I didn't know this. I mean, it really was. That took me a long time to learn. Uh, and eventually when I became a showrunner myself, you have to learn fast. So that's invaluable, knowing how to break a story. So can you explain what breaking a story is, the kind of definition yeah. of it? So when you have an idea, you have an idea for an episode, and then your first question is, well, is this, does this have enough weight to carry an episode? Or is this just a scene? It's just a funny, this is a line. And I think a lot of people, a lot of people struggle with that. I got a million ideas. I'm like, listen, I know you have a million ideas. I have a million ideas too. Half of them are shit. So how do we identify what are the good ones from the bad ones? Then once you have a good one, you figure, okay, I know what this, the, uh, the main dynamic is, but how do I break it into three acts so that I'm talking about what's my first act break, my second act break, what happens in the middle of act two, what happens, what are the, and so that's called breaking a story. And then you're, you're just doing that on a whiteboard. You're just putting the, the, the bare bones of what the story is. And then from there you make an outline and then you write a first draft. So it's all done in, in stages. Now, what, what did you learn from your biggest failure? I remember, I don't know if it was my biggest failure, but I remember my first job, it was, um, I was show running Marin and we wrote all the scenes, the writers would write a scene, uh, the scene, my partner, and I wrote this episode. And then in the writer's room, we rewrote it with everybody. That's common. The writers all worked together. Mark was there and we rewrote the scene and then we went to shoot it. And, um, Mark, we did a, we did a rehearsal. And then suddenly Mark kind of flew, like flew off the handlebars and he got really mad at me because I don't know what the hell I'm supposed to be playing in this scene. And I was like, oh, and and I look at the scene and I'm reading it real fast. Like, I got to fix it. I got two seconds to do a quick rewrite in the scene while all the camera people are waiting. We have a we have to move. We have to get off this because we have to shoot real fast. We don't have the luxury. And I'm reading the scene. And I'm like, oh, my God, Mark is right. I don't know what his character wants. No wonder he's getting mad at me. And we had one line. We fixed it with one line. And uh, with that one line was basically saying what Mark wanted in the scene. And with that, he was able to dial into the scene and that kind of saved the day. He was, okay, I got it now. But that's so important is knowing what each character wants in every scene. At some point during the rewrite, that line got cut and I wasn't paying attention and it got cut. And that's what ruined that scene, that one line. Interesting. And that's the job of a showrunner to catch that. Yeah. Yeah, while well, 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 the talent is yelling at you and, and all the grips are staring by laughing. That's the job. <laughs> well, so, I mean, obviously the writer is the most respected uh, part of the entire filmmaking process. Is that not Absolutely right? not. Absolutely <laughs> not. Because you know what? You would never tell the DP, you know what? I think you need to switch the lens. Or I think you should put an ND filter. You would never tell a DP that. But you have no problem telling the writer that I think this line could be that. I see. I hear that all the time. You know, it's, it's because because unlike the DP, there's a, a extreme amount of technical knowledge on the surface, right. as well as nuance in the background. With writing, we're like, well, I write. I've been writing yeah. since I was in first grade. I, I can hold a pencil. I can tell you what to do. It, it, that's what people think. Yeah, that's the difference. That's a huge difference. Yeah. Um, and what are you up to now? What's uh, what are you up to during the COVID world? I about a year ago, I decided I was going to write a collection of, of personal essays. I was going to see what that would be like. Like David Sedaris, I love these are genius. Like I love so, I've been doing that. I'm I have a website michaeljammon.com, and I kind of publish one every month. And then uh, that's been such a great journey, just discovering how to write a different form, different format. And then I'll seek, I'll seek out publisher. I don't know about a, you know six months or something like that. And then in the meantime, honestly, when this pandemic hit, I was like, I'm going to be in my garage. I think I don't see an end to this. You know, this is not three weeks. This is a year and a half. Mm -hmm. So. I have a friend who kept on uh, hounding me. He was a uh, PA on a show I work on. And he was like, you got to put together a course. I'm like, I, who's got the time to do a screenwriting course? And he goes, no, 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 I'll help you. I'll build the site. And I'm like, I don't have the time. Well, 
suddenly I had the time. So I, I took me about five months to, to build this thing, but I was like, okay. So I built a, an online screenwriting course and anyone who's listening in your audience, um, if you want to sign up, you'll get a, it's, it's still in beta. So you'll get a 10% discount and, um, and you'll be in beta and you can give feedback. And so that link is if you go to michaeljammon.com slash hustle. So michaeljammon.com slash hustle, cause it's your podcast. Mm-hmm. So then we'll, we'll get a, they'll get a discount at, at checkout and uh, like a ten percent discount, and then they'll also be in the beta, so it's lower pricing. So if they're interested, you can go to that. And that teaches you everything you need to know about being a TV writer. That, yeah, it's called the Showrunner's Guide to TV Writing, and it's basically everything that I wish I had known years ago. I mean, it's everything I've learned over the years from all the great writers I've worked under. And it's like this is the class I wish I had. So, and where can people find you and and your work and and what you're doing? Uh, yeah, so if you go also at michaeljammon.com, you can see whatever I'm working on, and you can read my essay. You can see some of the videos, I, some of the I make videos and stuff like that, and go check it out. And sign up for my newsletter. I'll send you a, I'll send you a new story every month, or you be in touch, or whatever you want. Uh, Michael, man, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, it's been an education uh, to say the yeah. least. So I really do appreciate it. And you can also. Uh, Michael Jammon writer on Facebook if they want to follow, follow me there too. We'll put it all in, we'll put it all in the show notes. Michael, thanks yeah. again and stay safe out there, man. Hey, thank you so much. What a pleasure.